So, um, this is the first interview we're going to do of many. And uh, what I was thinking was it was an opportunity while we can't be together in flesh as a whole church, but we can get to know different people in the church quite well. And uh, so you're the first of what I'm really hoping, as I said, there will be many folks uh, that we interview. And, and I began with you because you're one of the doctors in, in the church. And uh, clearly, at the moment, you're on the front line of, uh, of, of all the crisis that's happening. And just wondering, how's it all going for you as a doctor? Uh, I think it's obviously very different that we're probably down about half our doctors at the moment through either because they've got family members who are ill, so they've had to self-isolate or who are ill themselves. And everything's gone onto the telephone or online so that we limit how many people are coming in the building. Um, so it's just very different and it's actually a lot more tiring being constantly on the phone, mm. having people in and out of your room. And it's that making those judgments over who actually really needs to come in. Um, I suppose it's still early days as to what's going to happen because I think in Salford, they are quite on top of everything and are trying to keep potentially very ill people with COVID in one place and that they're assessed in one place so that it doesn't come into every GP surgery. But it is very different and we just have to take it day by day into how many doctors we're going to have. We have got some possibility to work remotely, but the technology is a bit limiting and... Um, so I suppose, and we don't have enough special laptops for every doctor. Sure. How long have you been a doctor? <clears throat> How long have I been? Since 2008. Okay. And, and in that time, what? That's 12 years, isn't it, Rosie? <laughs> what have you enjoyed about that? What have you enjoyed about being a doctor? I think, it, I suppose in most recent years, it's to be a grown-up, to be away from the kids, to actually have control as it were over my my day and to have adult interaction and I, I suppose I like having to make decisions and having to be decisive and to, to get on with things and to get to know some of my patients quite well which is part of why I became a GP. Hmm. Well in, ter in terms of sort of like choosing to become a, v a GP was that what was going on for you were you sort of thinking well actually I want to build relationships um, or what you know I think I think um, when I did, after I did my first year after becoming a doctor, I kind of was choosing between psychiatry or general practice. And I suppose one of the factors of general practice is the training's a lot more localised and the training is quicker and there's an awful lot of mental health in it. So I suppose it was kind of weighing up what would suit me best in terms of wanting to have kids. Charlie having a demanding job at the time. So that's I chose general practice. Are you glad you chose it? Yeah, I, mean, I think it suits me very well and it's very easy to work part-time. Yeah. yeah. Wait, what's your story of faith? When did you become a, how did you become a Christian? How did faith become real for you? What was that? Um, so I became a Christian when I was 12. Um, but the background to that, so I grew up in Wigan in what anyone who knows Wigan would say was the posh bit. And is there a posh bit of Wigan? Apparently, apparently Standish is the posh bit. <laughs> oh, right, yes. Uh, right, nice. So my dad's family, his parents were German Jews who'd escaped from Nazi Germany. So he was a bit confused in that if, you, if some people asked him, he'd say he was Jewish, but he was made to go to Sunday school to try and fit in with everyone else. Mm. So he would kind of pick and choose. Um, then my mum's parents, my gran would say she was a Methodist and her husband was an Anglican. And I think they couldn't agree which church to go to, so they didn't really go to one at all. Um, and then I started going sometimes with my dad, but usually on my own to the local Methodist church because I joined the girls' brigade. And to get a badge, you had to go to Sunday school every week. And I was the sort of kid who wanted a badge. Uh -huh. So um, I went along to Sunday school. And around the same time, um, I changed school um, because, as my gran used to tell the story, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't kept occupied enough in the local little school near where she lived. Um, so the family made a decision to send me to a school near Southport that was run by Christians. It was run as a charity. 
Oh, okay. Scarsbrook Hall. Uh, and there, most of the um, teachers were Christians, all the assemblies were Bible based, all the like, RE lessons were Bible based. And, but there was a big mix of, of children who went because it did very well academically. So it wasn't, if it, like my, one of my best friends who I'm still in touch with, her family's from a Hindu background. So it wasn't just all Christian children yeah. who'd come. Um, and I think that kind of is probably the biggest influence um, on me and that I joined the Christian Union when I was, I was probably about nine, ten, because I thought, well, I go to Sunday school, it must be similar. And I was a bit annoying in that I liked showing off the knowledge I knew from church at school and the knowledge I knew from school at church. So it just seemed a natural progression. And then I remember kind of age 11 kind of going up into senior school starting to think about what's this all about what's the kind of meaning of life and I think one thing that had disturbed me a bit is that you have to sit an entrance exam to get in the senior school of the same school and a few of my like peer group didn't pass the exam and were kind of asked to leave um, so I joined the Christian Union in the senior school and it had like teachers and there's another sixth form and everyone just seems to have a real peace about them a, kind of a real sense of kind of belonging and I think that was the first time I started to it, it it isn't about what I've done all my efforts to try and be good or to kind of get on with everyone that I need to be saved that I need a savior and I was on the bus on the way home from school and I just prayed a very simple prayer I was December of when I was 12 so I was just 12 and it just seemed to make perfect sense you know just seemed to why wouldn't I and I think at the time I thought a lot of my friends believed the same thing and it was started to get a bit older that I realized that not everyone believed this mm. but this is something I was going to have to keep choosing to follow mm. and especially with having a family who weren't Christians it <coughs> times I did get accused of being brainwashed and the like so there's a certain cost of yeah. What, what have you learned? What, I mean, as an adult now, what are the things that, um, what's the best lesson you've learned about following Jesus? I think it's, I think we touched on it when we did the fruitfulness on the front line at DVDs. It's that everything I do in my life, everything that God's given me to do is work for him. It's not just about what I do in church. Mm or what I do to be paid for. It's everything, it's looking after the kids, looking after my gran, how I interact with my friends. Everything I do is work for him and it's good works that he's given me to do. Mm. I think I spent quite a long, a few years at university getting a bit, because you, know, you always meet some Christians who are kind of saying, oh, I'm, I'm not working that hard at my, my uni work because I'm just here to tell everyone about Jesus. And I was like, no, I'm here to learn to be a doctor. I'm meant to put, all my effort into that I'm not meant to do a half-hearted job um, so I think when I getting clarity on that was quite helpful <laughs> it's like the North Korean diplomat at this point um, and and a scripture that brings you joy um, so I think when you I, I like the bit in um, 1 Peter where it says but um, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Mm. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Right. Brilliant. Just as you've had your North Korean moment, so have I. Um, but those two, that, that, those two thoughts, the passage and the um that idea of being in ministry that the whole of ministry counts yeah um it's all part of the same thing isn't it it's that sort of idea of uh, of being whole holy for yeah. him yeah how can we pray for you and your colleagues at this time uh, so i think it, the main prayer is that you know at the moment there's still that a kind of this is relatively new the kind of adrenaline kind of crisis mode that we're getting on we're being really busy but how long can we maintain that if this goes on as long as it, if you read that it says it might to maintain that oh well yes of course I'll take on extra work of course I'll come in extra days when it gets to the two three months mark 
yeah. it gets harder and harder to keep morale and that level of motivation. And I think the other thing to pray for is to run general practice. It's not just about the doctors that we were struggling, especially earlier in the week, because we didn't have enough admin staff to answer the phones, to deal with prescriptions, to look at the emails, like all that behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. But then as doctors, we had to start doing bits of that, which obviously then takes us away from the, the stuff we're meant to be doing. I think, yeah, I mean, perhaps at a time when we realise just how stretched the NHS can become in people like you. Um, yeah, and I think especially for those who answer the phones, because there's some people who get very angry yeah. when they can't have what they want right away, so even when it's not, it's not needed. So perhaps grace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and just for the public to realise that you know, we are doing our best yeah. and, you know, that they don't need to stockpile their inhalers. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's great to talk to you. Thanks for, for giving us the time. Um, these, you know, as I said, these are, are sort of not designed to be uh, very polished and this one isn't, but it's just a chance for us to get an insight into each other, into each other's lives and um, we will pray for you and pray for the others in the church as well who are in health care, um, that you'll know grace and you'll know wisdom. And yeah, you'll know stamina because who knows how long this yeah. unusual state of affairs are going to be. Yeah, and you can pray for Charlie at home with the kids. I will. But... Yeah, you'll be very pleased I didn't embarrass him. That, that was my <laughs> instruction. Okay. And uh, Rosie, thank you for being so good. I don't know if you're still there, Rosie, but you've been... been whisked um, away my dad. Okay. Bless you, Kate. Thanks ever so much. Thank All you. right. See you again soon. Bye, Bye now.